Bandar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it has always been a pleasure for me to go to India. It's a, a, a place I love. I love the culture. And it's a great honor for me today to present you. Let me just get to the presentation. So, uh, oh, let me just go to the beginning of that presentation. Uh, this morning, in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I would love to share with you and to give you the bottom line of the recent advances in endometrial cancer. Let me just get this out of the way for you. Um, I don't have any real conflicts of interest for the lecture this morning. Uh, these are just my interactions. And I have divided up the lecture in a few parts. And so the first uh, uh, advances that I want to talk to you is about the molecular biology and how it will influence and how it already influences our care in endometrial cancer. We'll then talk about minimal invasive surgery and how that has changed the whole horizon of uh, treatment of endometrial cancer. Uh, introduce you sentinel lymph nodes and then uh, say just a few words uh, and take home messages about fertility preservation in endometrial cancer for patients who uh, still would like to have uh, children. So first molecular uh, uh, biology. There has been a real fundamental paradigm shift with uh, around the turn of the century where we went, as you heard, uh, McGill was very strong in evidence-based medicine, but where we went from a uh, shift, a transition that we're witnessing from evidence-based medicine to really molecular medicine. And where in evidence-based medicine, we were geographically uh, interested in where the tumor started and in the tumor morphology, for instance, a serous tumors versus an endometrial tumors and how it looked under the microscope. Uh, and in this area, the, uh, this era, the holy grail was really uh, based on, on randomized trial and, and the ultimate truth came from uh, big randomized trials where we tried two treatments and the one of the two that was the better one was the winner. Uh, these were very slow and limited trials uh, and took a lot of time. In the area where we are today, uh, we really base ourselves on molecular phenotyping uh, of both the tumor but also of the environment of the tumor, which includes the host and its interaction with the tumor. This basically can lead to targeted therapies, uh, which are really biomarker driven. And although this is very complex and is very costly to analyze all of this, if we are very focused, we'll be able to deliver to the patient a more personalized medicine, and I prefer to call it precision medicine, uh, where only the patients that really will benefit from the treatment will get that treatment. As an, as an, just an introduction, uh, when we look at endometrial cancer, it's been divided now as you all know in type 1 and type 2. So if we very closely look at type 1, uh, it, they form about 80% of endometrial cancers. They're usually low-grade cancers. They're of the endometrioid histology when you look at them under the microscope. Uh, they arise uh, in uh, a background of unopposed estrogen and hyperplasia, and most of them are early stage and very favorable. On the other can, uh, hand, the type 2s are simply the opposite of what we have in type 1. Now, what does that mean from a molecular standpoint? So if we look at the cell, and this is a complex uh, slide that I already made extremely simple of some of the mechanisms uh, in the uh, uh, cell, and when we look at type 1 endometrial cancer, what we find is that 80% of type 1 endometrial cancers have some type of a, a mutation in P10. Uh, in addition, 40% uh, have uh, microsatellite instability. In 30% of them, you can find mutation in the pathway which involves beta catenin And we don't want to really get involved in it. I just want to give you an overview. Uh, we have another mutation, percent of mutation in RAS and PI3K. So this is what we find, the type of mutations that we find and abnormalities at the molecular level in the cell. 
That's for type 1. When we now look at type 2, it's completely different. And 80 to 90 percent of them will have mutations in p53. And as you can see, almost none of them uh, will have any mutation in the one in the types that we saw uh, in type one. So what drives the cancer in type one that we saw in the previous slide and in type two is completely different. So what we've learned is that although those start in the endometrium, they molecularly have nothing to do one with the other. That means that the treatment also should be completely different. So if we put that in a very simple perspective, when we compare type 1 and type 2, when you start out in norm, from normal endometrium in type 1, you have unopposed estrogen in the background of either germline mutation in the uh, uh, microsatellite uh, instability genes, or you have acquired, but usually by methylation mutations, which lead to simple hyperplasia, sometimes complex, with or without atypia, and then you have all of those mutations that we saw on the left-hand side of, this, of the cell that will drive this to intra-epithelial intra neoplasia, ultimately developing type 1 endometrial cancer. On the other hand, the balance is when you have the type 2s, you have a loss of estrogen and progesterone receptor, you're dealing with atrophic endometrium, and on the background of that atrophic endometrium, you're going to have the completely different mutation set compared to type 1 that will lead to what we call today intraepithelial carcinoma rather than intraepithelial neoplasia that will lead to type 2 endometrial cancers. Suggesting that again the treatment approach for these two in the future when we'll be able to target these mutations will be completely different uh, although they start in the same organ. So geography will start meaning less and less in our approach to the treatment. So this is basically on the molecular biology, the revolution that we're going to have. What we've had as surgery, in surgery as a revolution is the introduction of minimal invasive surgery. And the better we're going to be able to do treatment based on molecular biology, the more our surgery will become smaller and precise also. So we're going more and more towards precision medicine both on our treatment rather than giving chemotherapy that blasts all kinds of cells away, we'll be able to more target it. At the same time, that will go together with a more targeted surgery. And let's talk a little bit about that targeted surgery. So we all know as surgeons that surgery is a controlled injury because what we are licensed to do as surgeons is to aggress patients with a knife. And we need to do that in a very uh, rational way where the injury should be the minimum possible because of all of those effects that can happen when we basically aggress somebody with a knife. And, and I'm cynical with it, but for a purpose. So from a patient's perspective, the value of a surgery is going to be the efficacy of the surgery, which is the outcome of the surgery, divided by the invasiveness. So the least invasive you can be, the bigger the value for the same efficacy will be for the patient. So we're going to say perfect, you know, uh, since the lab 2 data that we all know about, the big randomized study uh, performed by Walker and colleagues in the, by the GOG in the United States, clearly showed that if you use laparoscopy compared to laparotomy, laparoscopy has improved uh, outcome with less complication, less antibiotic use, less hospitalization, better quality of life, less pain, quicker return to activities, and uh, which is goes together with uh, the same recurrence rate with a hazard ratio that really is around one and with an equivalent uh, three-year survival. So you're going to say, well, of course, we should all use laparoscopy because the outcome is much better than laparotomy. However, when you look at laparoscopy, it has, in my view, two major concerns. The first one, is that you're dealing with straight rigid sticks which makes the surgery less intuitive and that less intuitive is even accentuated by what we call the fulcrum effect where you operate on one side look at the screen on the other side and have to do counterintuitive movements that when your hand moves to the right your instrument actually moves to the left so some surgeons are extremely skilled at that but this is not an innate skill in most people. And when we look at the 
uptake of laparoscopy uh, in the United States uh, by GYN oncology, we could see that laparoscopy is never used by a majority of the surgeons, and that's after the data came out from the GOG study, that less than 25% of the surgeons, uh, sorry, that uh, a proportion of the surgeons use it in less than 25% of their patients, and it's actually rare that uh, surgeons, which is 6% of surgeons, used it in most of their patients. So laparoscopy really, if you put it on a Gauss curve, the percentage of patients that can benefit from laparoscopy is about 17% from the whole population. That's back in 2007 when we actually started our robotics program. And this is what we found when we started our robotics program. We were kind of like everybody uh, in uh, the mean United States where we had about 17% of our patients here in red that had laparoscopy for endometrial cancer and in yellow they had all laparotomy. When we started our program in December 2007, within one year, you can see in orange, two-thirds of our patients got minimally invasive surgery by robotics. That reached 95% within two years, with almost no patient getting laparotomy after that period, and we reached almost 100% now of our patients with cervical cancer uh, endometrial cancer and sarcomas, but for sure endometrial cancers that need laparotomy. So almost nobody today in our institution gets a laparotomy. You're going to say, well, that's your experience. However, you have heard uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, Dr. Letao talk about cervical cancer. When we look at their data at uh, Sloan Kettering, which for sure is a, one of the centers that used laparoscopy very much for endometrial cancer, this is their data. Where you have here in 1993 laparotomy and laparoscopy with about 10%, they quickly took over laparoscopy, this is by the end of my fellowship, the time of the end of my fellowship, and they stayed with laparoscopy for endometrial cancer somewhere between 20 and 40%, uh, where laparotomy was the remaining. With robotics at the same time we started in 2007, coming, you could see a dramatic increase in patients getting robotics. That goes together not with so much a decrease in laparoscopy, but with a dramatic decrease in laparotomy. So robotics has been able to provide to the patient minimally invasive surgery, whereas laparoscopy didn't really provide it to the majority of patients. We're going to say, okay, that's McGill, that's Sloan Kettering. Uh, but that's probably not uh, rural or general United States, uh, whereas it is actually. When you look at the statistics for uh, hysterectomy for malignancy in the United States, uh, you could see with the start of the robotics, here you have laparoscopy, which is somewhere around the 15 to 20% range in the U.S. Vaginal surgery really never uh, was a good option for uh, endometrial cancer, except in rare cases. But you see that as soon as robotics comes in, what drops dramatically is open surgery for uh, endometrial cancer. So basically, robotics has allowed to eliminate laparotomy where laparoscopy basically did not sufficiently deliver. Now, is that really in the advantage of the patient? And this is what we're going to look in this part of the uh, presentation. I will show you data and I will, so you will understand the improved outcomes and the cost effectiveness, at least in our systems, of robotics. So the first thing when we talk about cancer, we need to look at survival. And finally, we, got, we published our five-year survival uh, about a year ago. And what you could see that our five-year survival rate before robotics in the open surgery group was here and in the robotic groups is just above. So although it's not statistically significant, for sure robotics is not worse in outcome than open surgery. So that was the first thing we had to prove. Now, in this slide, I'd like to show the era before robotics, which was a mixture of laparotomy and laparoscopy, and what happened to our patients when we brought in the robot in the years following. And this was published uh, three years ago we saw 
at the wound complication rate, we went over from 15 to 3 percent. So we had an 80 percent decrease in wound complications. Our blood loss decreased by 75 percent. And our hospital stay decreased from five days to one day by 80 percent, which all are highly statistically significant. Interestingly enough, and in contrast to what everybody expected, the cost that we had in our institution for the era before to treat a patient with endometrial cancer in the era before robotics, it cost us $10,000, whereas in the era after, the price dropped by $2,000 per case. And that was mainly due to the decrease in hospitalization and in complications that we saw. So not only was it improved for the patient, but there was clearly a cost effectiveness uh, for our institution. When we now look at the complications in the robotic cohort compared to the historic cohort, you could see that for every complication, laparotomy in blue, and laparoscopy, so era before robotics, orange era after robotics, each complications that we analyzed, there was less of that in the orange in the robotic. And this was significantly significant for a few of them. We then analyzed the pain medication usage in the era before robotics and after robotics. And for instance, here you have acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, anti-inflammatories. And you can see a dramatic decrease in utilization of simple medications for pain control. But also from morphine derivatives, you can see a dramatic decrease in the use. So the patients not only had less complications, but also had significantly less pain. You're going to say, again, this is your data. How does that compare to what other people do? Well, we compared our data recently on our almost 500 cases of endometrial cancer compared to the lab two. So in the lab two, you have the laparotomy, the laparoscopy, and then we compare it to our robotics. I'm not going to compare it to the laparotomy, but at least to compare it to the laparoscopy arm of the lab two data. And we're comparing reasonably significant numbers. They had 1,700. We have about 500. Length of stay in the laparoscopy of lab two was three days. In our study, one day. Complications. 2.8% versus 10%. Conversion rate, 4.2% compared to 26% in the lab in the lab 2 uh, study. <laughs> Pain increase, way lower. And quality of life, also much better than in the laparoscopy arm. So clearly robotics added something even to the laparoscopy group in the lab 2 data. The question then becomes, are we representative of the patients that are the highest group? And when we think about the highest group, uh, we need to think about the elderly patients and the obese. So first about the elderly patients. Did they really benefit uh, from robotics as much as the rest of the group? And actually, we published quite a few papers on that because we were very interested because of the aging population that we have in our area. To make it very brief from all of the publication, I'll just send, present you one of the latest papers. 400 patients uh, with endometrial cancers treated by robotics divided by age, less than 65, up to 70, 70 to 80, and about 80. About 30% of our patient population is above the age of 70. And that 30% of uh, population clearly has higher risk based on their ASA level based on the advanced, uh, we find more advanced cancer in that population than in the younger population, and more high grade. So by every criteria, these patients in our population were at higher risk than the younger one. Despite that, what we could see is that the outcome of the surgery, we see similar times of surgery, three hours. We see simple, similar complication rates in the populations, similar blood loss, in the elderly, similar conversion rates, and similar length of stay. So overall, it is as though the robotics basically annihilated the risk factors of the uh, surgery for the elderly population. So how did it look for our obese population? 
And again, we analyzed uh, our obese population compared to our non-obese populations. And when we look at our statistics with the BMI here, with 30 being obese, we see that 50% of our patients basically had a BMI above uh, th uh, 30, and about half of them had a BMI above 40. So we were dealing with a significant proportion of obese population. And what we were going to do in the next slide is compare basically the morbidly obese to the obese to the non-obese population and see if there is a difference in outcome. So I can't resist to show you this data, which is a, a picture of our fellow that came over actually from Europe. And he's, in his first day in the OR, this is the case that he was. And we, we somebody catched a picture of him kind of banging in it and said, well, where did I arrive here? Well, what's going on? This patient had a BMI of 68.7 with a grade 2 endometrial cancer that we operated on robotically. Since then, we operated on a patient with a BMI of 85 uh, about eight months ago. And uh, that patient, actually, I saw her last week in the clinic, and she's doing well. When we now compare the three groups, again, to their outcome, again, what we could see is that by any means, the obese population is at higher risk for surgery compared to the non-obese. Despite that, again, we find that the surgical time is kind of stable, as you could see, you know, with a 20-minute difference in the BMIs above 40. Uh, the conversion rate is similar. The blood loss is similar. Hospitalization time is similar. Complication rate is similar. And return to normal activities is similar. Again, indicating that the minimal invasive approach that here we were able to do by robotics uh, allowed to basically put everybody on the same level uh, for risks, whether obese or non obese. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to compare is the conversion rate. Why? Because in the lab 2 study, they had a pretty high conversion rate in the laparoscopy, which was 25%. That conversion rate increased by 30% for each decade of life, and 56% of the patients with a BMI above 40 had a conversion to open surgery. Uh, we just saw that our conversion rate, I don't know how well you paid attention, but our conversion rate was extremely low uh, in these two populations. And when we looked at our data, what we saw when we looked at conversion since we started robotics in a six months interval is we saw that after a year and a half our conversion rate basically dropped to zero with a conversion rate for the entire population until today of 4.2 percent on an intention to treat basis. Why was that? That it completely disappeared here. We realized that almost all of our conversions were due because of a large uterus that we could not deliver through the vagina and had to do a mini laparotomy to remove the uterus intact because obviously there is no question of morselating or of cutting into pieces a uterus with cancer. Uh, so we had to do a laparotomy at the end of surgery just to remove the uterus. What we started doing here was to do side docking instead of perineal docking, which gave us better access at the end of surgery to remove the uterus between the legs. The other thing that we installed was we started using large endo bags. So if the uterus was too big to be delivered intact at the end of surgery, we would put through the vagina a big endo bag, put the uterus in the big endo bag, bring it to the vulva, and then cut it within the endo bag and take out the uterus without contamination. Uh, of the pelvic uh, cavity or of the vagina. And we've had a few of those in the first article that we published in 2010, clearly describing that we were able to do it in almost everybody. So clearly, I would, what I showed you is that we were able to completely eliminate almost laparotomy with improved outcome and with the patients with the, at the highest risk also benefiting it. Ultimately, my view today is that laparoscopy, uh, that, sorry, that robotics is nothing else than laparoscopy with better tools. To put it as an image, this is a beautiful airplane, uh, which is a Spitfire, that allowed our fathers and grandfathers to keep the world free in 4045, in 1940, 1945. 
Today, this is how some of those airplanes look. I don't know if I had to go to war today, I'd rather go with this engine uh, with me rather than with this engine. It would give me a lot of more advantages than this. It doesn't mean that this is not good. This is just a perfect engine that was very useful, but it has less potential than all of the computer-based engine that I would be able to use today. So going over to our next part, which is the Sentinel lymph node. Should we or should we not do a lymphadenectomy uh, for endometrial uh, cancer. In 1988, Kreisman's paper really turned the whole way we approach endometrial cancer by introducing surgical staging, which has basically the advantage that it gives us a pro better prognosis than clinical staging, and that it allows us to guide to a more personalized, again, precision medicine appropriate treatment. Despite this, two large randomized studies, the Aztec study and the Italian study showed that there was no benefit in complete lymphadenectomy uh, compared to selective lymphadenectomy. And there are associated side effects with lymphadenectomy, such as lymphedema, lymphocyst formation, higher uh, risk of vascular and nerve injury, and prolonged surgery. So the question really becomes between the American approach of complete staging and the more European approach uh, and Australian approach, where do we stand? What is the right balance? And we as Canadians, of course, are somewhere in the middle between these two, and we choose sentinel node approach to evaluate if that would give us the answer. And I'll try to show you that it, this is probably the best intermediate approach between the two. So in our first paper that we published in 2012, uh, we were wondering, we were using blue and technetium, and we were wondering where should we inject that. There has been some controversy if it should be subserosal where the tumor is, should it be hysteroscopic or should it be in the cervix. Now, I took out of the literature all the studies that had more than 30 cases. And what we have is, you could see six, four, and 18 studies with the number of patients in those studies ranging from 200 to 2,000 with a detection rate that is about stable in the 80% range, with actually cervix being the best detection rate. Bilateral detection rate is also the best with cervical injection, and sensitivity is kind of stable for all of them, with number of sentinel nodes stable. So for me, it was a no-brainer that the place where we needed to inject was in the cervix. I took a summary of those papers with more than 30 patients, for you, you see there are a few with just barely 30 patients, and some studies with a lot of patients, our studies with 100, some studies with two and 300. For a total of 2,300 published studies now, up to 2015, on sentinel nodes. 91% sensitivity, 98 negative predictive value, 321 positive nodes, which is about 14%, 15%, which is exactly what we would have expected with full lymphadenectomy. So we pick up those nodes. Interestingly enough, in those studies, in 46% of the cases, half of the cases, the sentinel node was the only positive node. So if you would have done a complete lymphadenectomy, removing 50 nodes, but they would have missed the one sentinel node to analyze, you would have missed half of your patients with positive nodes. And that might explain why the Aztec study and the Italian Benedetti study didn't show any difference. So in our first paper, let me just very briefly uh, bring you through it. We had 11 patients who had positive notes out of the first 100 patients. That's an 11% uh, positive uh, note count, which is about what we would have expected. Nine out of those 11 were picked up by the sentinel nodes. And the two other ones, actually, it's not that we missed them, it's because we could not detect the sentinel nodes in those patients. So we picked out all of the positive ones, and in four of, the, of these, which is exactly what the studies have shown, 40% of these, the sentinel node was the only positive node. 
In seven of the hundred, the central node was actually in the periaortic area, I remind you, we ejected the cervix, and despite that, we're capable of picking up the periaortic nodes in those patients without any ipsilateral pelvic node, where the, the cervix drains directly to the periaortic area by bypassing the uh, pelvis, suggesting that cervical injection is the right place to inject. Interestingly enough, another finding of that study was that half of our patients were low risk, were pre-op grade ones. 18 of those 51 were upgraded uh, at final pathology, which we know 30% of grade ones uh, on final pathology are upgraded. Every study has shown that. And out of those 18, four had a positive note. That means that we had four patients who, out of the 11 patients that had positive notes in our study, that had a pre-op grade one. That means that 30% of our patients with positive notes had preoperative grade one, completely going against the idea that patients with a grade one endometrial cancer should not have lymphadenectomies done because a significant proportion of them will have a positive note, which has clear implications on who should operate on those patients. And although it's 4 out of 50, which is only 8% of patients with pre-op grade 1 will have positive notes, it makes one-third of the patients in our population that had a positive note. So this was our study, 90% detection rate, 70% uh, bilateral rate, using blue and radioactivity. Then came a paper from Rossi, uh, from uh, Carolinas, that, uh, from UNC, on 20 patients that used only ICG green uh, with the robot. They had an 88% detection rate, a 60% bilaterality rate, and soon after came a paper from Holloway who used blue and green, and they had 100% detection and 100% bilaterality. So we were kind of uh, wondering what we should be going and doing. And what we did, we did triple uh, dye injection. So we used green, radioactivity, and blue in 100 patients, and we were wondering what we would find. And that was uh, the way that we injected these uh, services, again, injection in the cervix, was a mixture of ICG, technetium, and blue. We injected superficially under the mucosa at 3 and 9 o'clock, and then deep into the cervix, reaching the lower uterine segment to have a better representation of the endometrium, also with these three dyes. These are the pictures uh, of a typical case where you could see that by cervical injection, superficially and deep at the lower isthmic, what you get is blue in the entire cavity. And if you look at ICG, you can see the whole uterus becomes green. So very clearly showing that by cervical injection, you get the entire sampling of the uterus. You don't need to inject where the tumor is, which is here, to get complete sampling of the uterus of where the sentinel nodes will be. This is an example uh, of that case where you could see on the right pelvic side wall, the lymphatic in blue and the blue lymph node. And this is how it looks when you turn on the ICG, very clearly identifying where the node uh, is. In addition, this is an example of where we inject in the cervix and you could barely see the blue along the IP but here you clearly see how the green goes along the IP ligament straight to the periaortic area. I'd just like to use a few examples now to show unusual places that we would not have picked up if we didn't use the ICG. So the first one, we're here uh, at the inferior vena cava at the insertion of the IP ligament. Here is the ureter. This is IP ligament. This is the insertion of the IP ligament. And with the blue, really, we don't see very much here. However, when we turn on the green, you very clearly see how the sentinel got along the IP ligament exactly at the insertion. Another example here, this is the uterus, the sigmoid, the presacral area. And we're basically dissecting here in this area. And the reason is, although you can't see it in normal color, Despite the injection of blue, there is no blue here. However, if you turn on the ICG, you can very nicely see how the green tracks 
below the ureter along the sacrum to the presacral area and this is where we found our seminal node. So basically in this example it goes along the ureter to the insertion of the IP ligament. Here it goes along under the ureter over the presacral, the promontorium and goes to the periortic area over the promontorium here. A different way not along the IP ligament. And the third example I would like to show you is we are on the right side. This is uterine artery. This is internal iliac artery. This is the hypogastric vein. The ureter is here on the left. And we're dissecting in this area over the hypogastric vein, which is an area where basically nobody goes to do a dissection. Because on that area, what we found with the green is that the green was tracking down to the hypogastric vein very posteriorly in the pelvic cavity to have the sentinel node very deep, way below the uterine artery that's over here. Again, the ICG bringing us, in summary, to very unusual places where we would not have expected to find a positive node. And as I've shown you before, if 40% of the nodes, uh, the, of the positive nodes are in the sentinel node only, then by leaving that node here and doing a full lymphadenectomy, you wouldn't be able to say whether or not this patient has a positive node. So our detection rate overall at this point is 92%, bilaterality 80%, and paraortic detection 8%. Very nice that we can find it. But does it really have an impact on treatment? And actually, when we look at our 200 patients, 26 of them had positive nodes, sentinel nodes. Now, when we look at the risk factors for those patients based on the Aztec study or the KEYS uh, study, all those 26 would have received adjuvant treatment based on uterine factors alone. So if we would not have done lymph node dissection, these patients would have received anyway adjuvant treatment. So we didn't help those patients by doing only sentinel nodes. However, if we would base ourselves on uterine factors alone, 82, 40% of our patients would have received adjuvant radiation. What we did is by doing nodes, we avoided external beam radiation to half of those 80 patients. So half of our patients, we avoided them the complication of external beam by knowing that the nodes were negative. And that's, I think, is a big advantage. This is the distribution of where we found all of the sentinel nodes uh, in all of our cases. You see about 10% periortic. Most of them were in the external iliac and obturator area. But some were actually in unusual places. 5% we found the sentinel node in the presacral area. 3%, like I showed you, on the internal iliac vein very deep in the pelvis, and about 1% in the parametrium. These patients would usually not be picked up by what we call a regular lymphadenectomy because we don't systematically go presacral or into the internal iliac area. That means that about 8% total of our patients, the sentinel the, where the money is, where, this, where we would have found uh, the sentinel, would not have been picked up by a regular lymphadenectomy. And that has Im important implication to interpret the data from uh, the studies on lymph node, like the Aztec study and the Benedetti study. Because if you would not have picked up 8% of the nodes that are important, and you're trying to improve the outcome, which is already extremely good, then of course your study is not powered and you will not be able to show that lymph node dissection is worthwhile to direct your treatment. So this is the area of uh, decreasing more precision medicine both in molecular biology, in surgery, and using the sentinel node. Just a few words of where we stand in fertility preservation treatment for endometrial cancer. In our first study, we showed that about, and many other people have showed, 
about 10% of patients with endometrial cancer are premenopausal. Out of those, half of them are above the age of 40 and usually not interested in fertility, but half of them are, or a little bit less than half, are below the age of 40 and still want to preserve fertility. In those, a lot of them have anovulatory cycles and they desire fertility. Back in 1961, 50 years ago already, uh, uh, Kelly and uh, Baker suggested that maybe progestational agents could be used to treat early endometrial cancer. Where do we stand in 50, now 50 years later? This is the total of publication back up to 2013. There were 38 publications on fertility preservation for endometrial cancer for a total of 600 patients that were presented and published. The types of progesterones that were used were medroxyprogesterone acetate in half of the studies, uh, magestrol in about a quarter, and then uh, the uh, Mirena or levonorgestrel uh, IUD in about 20% of the cases, and then the remaining are all kinds of a mixture of other types of progesterones. The issue with progesterone is that it can lead to liver abnormalities, thromboembolisms, headaches, and nostalgia. So it's not completely benign, but overall the, the profile for these young patients is not bad. What are the results of those studies? Very in brief, in red is per, you could see per year of the studies, the number of cases per studies, and in orange is basically a resume and a summary of all of those studies. What we have is that the mean regression for all of those studies is response to treatment 76%. And that's in 400 patients out of that database where we have that uh, result. So 76% regression of the endometrial cancer, a 40% recurrence after the regression. So half of the patients recur after they have regressed. And in the recurrence, we see six patients with advanced disease and four patients who died. That's 10 out of 250. That's about 4% of patients with bad outcome. And we could see that over the years, basically about 20% of the patients who had uh, regressions were capable of conceiving. So the treatment works, allows to get pregnant, but the recurrence rate is pretty high. When we look at the risk of this treatment, we look, we could look, basically there is not very much in the uh, literature, but when we look at uh, patients less than 45 year old with endometrial cancer, uh, in an Australian study, they found that five out of 17 uh, patients with stage three and four were below the age of 45. So you do find advanced stages in patients uh, younger than 45. And if you look at patients less than 40, we have here 19 out of 95 that had advanced stage and four patients died. We found about a 15% in an NCI database, 15%, 17% had stage three or four. And here we find about 20% had tumors in the ovary. So clearly there is a certain risk in young patients who have advanced disease and disease uh, in the ovary at the time of diagnosis of a endometrial cancer. So it's not completely, completely uh, without risk. And I think we need more data and more studies to evaluate what can be done for those young infertile patients who still want to maintain fertility. So following all of this, what is the take home uh, message? What are the pearls of what I presented to you today? Well, clearly, uh, the game of endometrial cancer is changing. There is a new game in town, and we need to decide how we're going to best negotiate that new approach of endometrial cancer. And the take-home pearls of today is, what I've shown you in the first part is, that there is a very significant difference in the molecular pathology between type 1 and type 2. And when we'll learn more about it, we'll be able to get more to personalized medicine. I've shown you that we can basically eliminate laparotomy, and that robotics is just laparoscopy with improved instruments. That's it. That's all. If you can do it by laparoscopy, if you have those specific brain connections that allow you
to do those counterintuitive movements safely by laparoscopy, of course you should do it. If not, robotics is a way to be able to get to almost 100% elimination of laparotomy for endometrial cancer. Clearly, minimal invasive surgery improves all kinds of things that I've shown you, less complications, and it is very appropriate for the obese and for the other. We looked a little bit at sentinel node, which I do believe is also decreasing the amount of surgery to get even better results as before. It is a practical alternative to know what goes on in the lymph nodes until some molecular markers will be able to help us decide how to treat uh, these patients. Cervical injection is an easy way, accessible, uh, non-complicated, very reproducible. It shows that we would have missed 8% of uh, the, the important node if we would have done a major but standard dissection. That 30% of those who have positive nodes had a pre-op of grade one and that we cannot just say that grade one should not have node dissections. And that we were able with our protocol, which is actually the protocol of Sloan Kettering, and I need to give all the credit to uh, uh, Abu Rustam and his group to come up with that protocol, that we avoid a 20% of radiation to the patients uh, that we treat. And oh, finally, for fertility conservation, we have 38 publications that we analyzed uh, on 600 patients, which is not very much, with a 76% recurrence, 20% recurrence, but a risk of synchronous uh, cancers and bad outcome in stages three and four, and that we still need to be careful how to treat those and have very strict protocols for that. Thank you very much. I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, after this 45 minutes that I've had a monologue. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Gottlieb. This is Dave. Uh, we do have one question for you, and it is, what is your protocol for lymphadenectomy, SLN, or routine pelvic and para-aortic lymphadenectomy, and an apparent stage one, grade one, endometrioid cancer? Okay, so let me divide it up in two parts. The first uh, part of the question is, what is our protocol in apparent early stage grade one? And in apparent uh, early stage grade one, with the data that we have in our institution on sentinel lymph node, with a 98% negative predictive value, in those patients, we only do sentinel lymph node protocol. Now, the sentinel lymph node protocol means if we find the sentinel node, then that's the only node we take out if it's negative. If we don't find on, on one side uh, the sentinel node, then that site is basically not mapped, and that site gets a lymphadenectomy. So either we find the sentinel node, and that's enough, or we don't find a sentinel node, and in these cases, we do a full lymphadenectomy. Uh, that not, not finding a node and not doing a lymphadenectomy is not sufficient. Uh, in 80% of our cases, we find a sentinel node on both sides. In those cases, that's the only thing we do. If the node is positive, we will do a full lymphadenectomy uh, to that patient to evaluate whether or not there are other nodes that are positive. A study that was published a month ago by uh, Marie Plante and her group in Quebec showed that if the metastasis in the sentinel node is less than two millimeters, basically there are no other nodes involved. So if, you, if our metastasis today in the sentinel node is less than two millimeter, we stop our dissection. So negative sentinel nodes or nodes with a metastasis of less than two millimeters, we stop the lymphadenectomy uh, on that side. If we find it on both sides, that's the end of the dissection. The only ones where we continue doing full lymphadenectomies are the high grade, grade threes and papillary serous, type twos, uh, because we want to accumulate more numbers to show that our negative predictive value in those cases is still 98% and we're getting close to that number. So I can see ourselves very shortly going over to only the sentinel lymph node protocol. Thank Long you. Answer to another question. question. Do you recommend hysterectomy once a patient who had fertility preservation has completed her family? 
Okay, based on the numbers that we have and the risk of poor outcome in a slow number at this point and the high regression rate, so we have three factors. There's not very many cases published. There is a risk of disease outside of the uterus and uh, the, re the uh, recurrence rate is 40%. We uh, do uh, advocate for a hysterectomy at the end of fertility, when the patient has finished her fertility. Yes, absolutely, based on these three factors, at this point, this is the only safe thing to do. Any other questions, Dave? Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. My microphone was off. Dr. Gottlieb, this has been really fascinating. We don't have any more questions, but I'm going to see if Dr. Bondari may want to have a couple of closing comments with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gottlieb. And even a urologist could understand, though we are neighbors in pelvis, but uh, it's a totally fascinating area. And uh, I think uh, you really approach the subject uh, in a very, very scientific manner. At one end, you are hitting uh, the molecular uh, configuration of the tumors and trying to have a personalized treatment for specific cancers or specific patients. At other end, you have really exploited the robotic surgery. And what I like your comment on uh, that it's not uh, competitive with the uh, uh, robotic and laparoscopy. And that's what I mean, that if any uh, laparoscopic surgeon is skilled enough to do everything, but uh, only thing is simply because he is glued to laparoscopy, uh, he should not submit the patient for robotic, um, for open surgery. So I think uh, it was a fascinating uh, account of what your work on endometrial cancer is. I'm sure my colleagues have been benefited and I once again thank you for accepting our invitation and sparing your precious time in preparing for this webinar at the same time being with us on Saturday. We'll connect with you again and thank you very much. Thank you everybody.